We all know the terrors of the backlog, whether it's that shelf of games that stares back at you with neglect or the intimidating size of your Steam library that only seems to get bigger every passing week. The backlog is filled with games that we know we need to play, but we just haven't gotten around to it yet. My friends are always giving me recommendations of games I need to play, series I should invest my time into, and I mean, I try to play as many games as I can get my hands on because I think it's important to play games you're not sure you'll enjoy in order to gain a new perspective on your favorites. I'm not saying to go out and try Doki Doki Literature Club if your current favorite series is Call of Duty, but even still, maybe that could work out, I won't judge. But again, you never know. You could end up finding a new style of game that you love more than your current favorites. It's very important to play new things. That's my PSA for this video. Or you could just say f that and play something you know is going to kick ass. Now, I've played my fair share of first-person shooters. I'm a huge Halo fan, the Half-Life franchise is something of a distant fascination, and I've even recently been dragged into Destiny 2 against my better judgment. But there's an inherent difference between arena shooters, cinematic shooters, or RPG shooters, and boomer shooters. This was always a weird term to me, and I don't remember when I actually heard it first, but Boomer Shooter refers to an explosive shooting game with a fast pace and lots of mobility, with the two modern Doom games being ones that most will probably think of today. Doom Eternal has been one of those backlog games that I've been sleeping on ever since it was released back in 2020. I did play Doom 2016 when it first came out and actually enjoyed it quite a bit, even went back through a few times to grab extra achievements and collectibles and all that crap. I would consider that game fantastic, but I don't know what I was thinking when Eternal came out because I just let it slide. That's weird though, right? What just completely made this game slide under my radar? Well, hang on, let's see. Eternal came out in March of 2020. Oh, see look, th that makes sense. Mystery Dungeon DX came out on the 6th of March. That probably had something to... Oh, oh. Half-Life Alex came out on the 23rd. That'll do it. Yeah, having the flagship VR release of that year also being the next Half-Life game probably took up a little bit of my schedule around that time. Judging by all of the great scores Doom Eternal relished in during its release and after has me excited though. I missed the initial hype for this game, but I'm curious to know if this game was good enough to keep the hype going years after that last piece of DLC was dropped. No more new releases, no more surprise releases, I'm ready to finally rip and tear into this absolute absolutely fantastic game. I hope I don't piss anyone off by saying this, but I don't really care about the overarching plot in Doom games. My number one goal in these things are to blow shit up before the shit blows me up, you know? I've never been interested in the plight of Doom Guy or his rabbit Daisy. The plot essentially revolves around killing demons until they stop coming to Earth, and with this, the plot is consistent. Doom Guy's body language is always so cold and focused on his objective. The way these first person perspective shots are animated is so interesting to watch. This might sound a little weird, but I always get Homelander vibes when I see Doom Guy doing anything. It's like watching a nuclear bomb of a man tick away and you have no idea what he's going to do because he's capable of so much. It's also why I find this to be peak comedy. I don't know how you don't laugh at this kind of thing. His actions usually line up with what the player is thinking anyway and that's getting back into the action. So when Doom Guy does things that get him back to killing shit, you can't help but smile and connect with this monster on some sort of weird level. It's a pretty messed up level but I think some some sort of understanding is there from the player. I felt this the most when he shot himself out of a BFG cannon just to get back to killing stuff. I know what Doom Guy's wallet must say, because yep, the reason you're playing Doom Eternal is to rip and tear. 
This has got to be one of the most complex first-person shooters I have ever played, and I mean that fully as a compliment. While the term movement shooter was around before this thanks to games like Titanfall and Titanfall 2, and hell, even boomer shooters like Quake, Unreal Tournament, and the classic Doom games were heavily focused on chaotic movement. But Doom Eternal almost certainly has more weapons, tools, and options that the player constantly must use to stay alive. And it's sick. As far as movement options go, Doom Guy has a standard jump, double jump, and two uses of an air dash that can shoot him in any horizontal direction. Environments can also hold a few movement pieces like gravity wells that can shoot him into the air, or my personal favorite, monkey bars that allow him to swing above the battlefield. And they aren't used in combat arenas, but these textured walls can be grabbed onto. They're great for platforming segments that I'll get into later, but they're not snappy enough for combat encounters. The movement is honestly perfect. In and out of combat, the default movement speed is generally pretty fast. Maneuvering around enemies and their projectiles is never frustrating, but always stressful in the best possible way. What good is fantastic movement, though, if there's no way to interact with the enemies? Good thing Doom Guy's arsenal holds some top-tier weapons of mass destruction. Each weapon and piece of equipment in Doom Eternal has multiple purposes and strengths. Some come from the incredible enemies and the interactions that they bring, and others come from the two modifications that each weapon can eventually unlock. Starting at the top, we have the Combat Shotgun, a decently strong weapon with a short to moderate range. Good for just about any situation and some of the most common ammo in the game, so I don't feel bad for using it to mop up smaller enemies after the big fights. Its first weapon mod is a sticky grenade launcher. This thing is great for peppering the enemies and disrupting clusters of them. It can eventually be upgraded to shoot five grenades continuously, which makes it a great means of dealing damage while on the move. The second weapon mod is a full auto mode. It can have the shotgun spray blasts of lead without having to load any rounds in between. It's ideal for unloading big damage when you have a moment to slow down and focus on a single target. Then there's the heavy cannon, the rapid fire assault weapon of this arsenal. This is another one that's decent on ammo, so it's good for long range and small fries. But it's also one of the most precise weapons you have access to, and this is taken to the next level with its first and most important mod, the Precision Shot. I would argue that this is one of, if not the most important weapon mod in the game. Not only does it do good damage from across the arena, but it's also used for hitting precise enemy weak points so often. There are even a few hints in the game that teach you to essentially quickscope with this mod, and it's so incredibly satisfying. The other mod is a Micro Missile Launcher. There aren't any auxiliary uses for this one. The main draw is that it's very good at outputting high damage in a short time, even if it does eat through the heavy cannon's ammo. And I don't tend to use it when I'm low on health because of the delay the explosions have. It's almost impossible to stop firing once they start glowing for a glory kill because by that point they have several missiles embedded into them, and then they explode and take the enemy with them. Not a bad weapon mod, but not great for precision damage. Next is the Plasma Cannon, the fastest rapid fire weapon in the arsenal. This thing shoots orbs of energy in a straight line. The damage is low, but the high rate of fire can make it pretty dangerous for any nearby demons. Especially smaller demon, the Plasma Cannon pops these guys like a balloon with only a few shots. Its first mod allows it to store up to three thresholds of energy after firing normal rounds. The more thresholds are met, the larger and more deadly this explosion will be once let loose. And there's even an upgrade that gives normal shots a boost in strength after after unleashing a full power blast. The second mod is a microwave beam that holds a single enemy in place while pumping it full of energy, and if the bar fills, then that enemy is toast. This is probably one of my least favorites, mainly due to how it reduces your movement so drastically, essentially making you stand still to take out just one enemy. It becomes more useful later on in the game, but early on, I don't swap to it. This is certainly the highest firing rate you'll have access to in Doom Eternal, the chain gun. The standard fire is fast and furious, reaching good distances with low damage, high frequency shots. It's one of my personal favorites, in fact, and easily has one of my favorite mods in the game, the Mobile Turret Mode. This is supposed to be a mod that makes you stand stationary, but absolutely churn out ammunition in a single direction. Its weapon upgrades are also some of the most useful in the game that I couldn't imagine not having them. Fast Gunner brings the turret's movement speed close to normal walking speed. Rapid Deploy increases the transformation speed to the point where I barely remember transformation speed was an issue. And Ultimate Cooling stops the weapon from ever stalling, meaning you can just shoot this thing until it runs out of bullets. The second mod gives the chain gun a shield, but to be honest, I never used this once in my 25 hours of game time. I could have very well slept on a crucial part of the arsenal, but the mobile turret is so good that it's all I needed. Next is the rocket 
launcher. This one should be pretty self-explanatory. It does great damage and good splash damage. The first mod allows it to load three rockets and lock onto a single target. This mod is an easy go-to when I need to dish out big damage. It drains ammo quickly, but the damage output is so worth it. Not having to be precise to dish out this much pain while on the run is a godsend. The second mod though, not so much. The remote detonation mod allows a rocket to be detonated at any point during its flight. It gets slightly more useful when it gains a shockwave upgrade that disrupts enemies, but I usually don't swap to it. Next, we come to the ultimate damage dealer, the super shotgun. It easily does the most damage of the entire arsenal in a single close range shot. But unlike the other firearms, the super shotgun has no weapon mods to unlock or equip. The alternate fire for this weapon is the meat hook, a grappling hook that at least in the main campaign, doesn't hook onto grapple points, but instead sinks into enemies and pulls Doom Guy towards a single target, making it easier to get a point blank shot in. The super shotgun is the gun you pull out when you want to do big damage. It's that strong. And the other weapon you want to bring out for big damage is the ballista. This long range bolt of energy is like a mix between a sniper rifle and a rocket launcher. Firing one single high powered shot, the ballista can cover just about any range with good damage to boot. But the shots take a moment to recharge so you'll have to be steady. The first mod is a charged blast that fixes the splash damage deficiency of the standard shot by sticking into the enemy and detonating a concussive blast a moment later. It's okay, but I don't use it a whole lot. The second one doesn't get used too much either, but that's because it takes too long to charge up. This shot charges a line of energy that travels in a straight trajectory and will cut most enemies in half if it makes contact. It's unbelievably strong against everything, but it earns that power due to the absurd charge time. Both of these attacks are good, but I try not to use them willy-nilly because of how valuable the ballista is for high-powered targets. The final weapon you get is a giant blue laser that can destroy enemies from mid to long range. Wait. Mm, this looks weird. No, the actual final firearm you get access to is the BFG, which stands for Big Friendly Giant, written by Road Dog. This huge shot of mean green will jog through the air, connecting tendrils of energy to every enemy in the arena, killing most and leaving the rest with barely any health to fight with. It is the original oh shit button, but even then, there's a degree of strategy to it, seeing as how there are enemies that it won't even phase, you can only carry two shots at a time, and refilling it can only be done by finding these pickups scattered throughout levels or arenas. Firearms only make up the bulk of the player's arsenal though, there are a handful of supportive skills to cover, with most of these skills feeding into Doom Eternal's most interesting aspect, its resource management. These abilities often turn enemies into one of three resources, health, armor, or ammo. The most integral of these, obviously, is health, and the glory kill is the solution. After an enemy has been weakened enough, they become staggered and start flashing blue. The flash changes to orange when you get within range, and after pressing the melee button, a small cinematic finisher will play, taking the enemy out and spawning some health pickups. When finding yourself low on health, it's perfectly viable to take a step back and safely weaken some small enemies to get yourself back into fighting shape. The blood punch, which is an upgrade to the melee attack, can also spawn smaller amounts of health if used to finish off enemies. This melee shockwave can be great for a lot of things, but I often use it to link two shots of the super shotgun together by skipping the reload animation. And it's also just great for taking care of a cluster of enemies. Armor is just as important to staying alive as health, and the flame belch is how you get it. This shoulder mounted flamethrower will shoot a jet of fire to hit targets within medium range. This will inflict the burning effect to targets, which will cause them to steadily drop small armor pickups. They'll drop a surplus of these if they're killed while still burning too. It's easily the best way to recover shields if you don't have a big pot in your inventory. Oh. Hey, I don't think- The burning effect does little to no damage though, so it's not good for actually hurting the enemies. If I found myself surrounded by a group of weak enemies, I would activate the flame belch and then spin in a circle, hitting as many of them as I can. And then mopping up those enemies would make for a quick armor refill. This maneuver isn't as practical in the heat of an intense fight though. A shoulder mounted grenade launcher holds two concussive grenades and one ice grenade that will freeze any demon solid for a few seconds. Both grenade types are good for damage on the run, but I often found myself throwing them out there while firing other weapons. There are a list of passive perks called runes that you can equip to Doom Guy that make a difference as far as how he plays. These don't make large sweeping differences, but they do have small impacts on the details of your playstyle. For instance, I think one of the most useless runes is the one that increases the speed of the glory kills. To me, glory kills are small momentary breathers to not only catch my breath, maybe adjust my big ass in my chair, but also from other enemies. Shortening the glory kill essentially reduces your invincibility frames for that period, and that just seems unwise to me. I would much rather give that rune slot to the one that increases control I have over Doomguy in midair, allowing for far more manageable death from above scenarios. 
The Crucible is given to you at the very end of the main campaign and it simply kills one demon. I'm not a huge fan because it's just an instant kill button. It only has three charges and can only be refilled by finding pickups. But it kills most super demons in one hit so it's not much of a question on what it needs to be used on. It'd be a straight up waste to use it on anything that's not a heavy or a super heavy demon. This is likely why it wasn't kept for any of the other extra modes after the original story. Therefore, it makes more sense that in the second DLC chapter we were given access to the Sentinel Hammer, a far more useful melee weapon that also works off of found charges. Activating the hammer will slam the ground and daze nearby demons and drop some ammo, but it can also amplify other status effects. If a demon is burning before being hammered, they'll drop even more armor, and if demons are frozen by the ice bombs, they'll shatter and drop health pickups. Both status effects can even be stacked, making the hammer a far more interesting option than the Crucible absolutely earning its inclusion in horde mode campaigns as well as the second DLC. Finally, the Chainsaw, a support skill that really requires the most thought out of what it gets used on. The Chainsaw will instantly kill whichever demon you use it on and spawn a surplus of ammo, but it can't be used on super heavy demon classes which we'll cover in just a moment. The Chainsaw runs off of pips of gasoline jugs you can find throughout levels. It can hold three pips max and depending on which demon type finds the Chainsaw ripping them apart will determine how many pips are depleted. Small demons only require one pip of gas, but if you want to take down a heavy demon it will take three pips. The the only downside is that the amount of ammo dispensed doesn't depend on what class of demon you chainsaw. A lowly zombie will give you the same amount of ammo as an Arachnotron would when chainsawed. The only real benefit is taking a heavy demon out instantly, because they can sometimes be trouble, but heavies aren't the most intimidating thing on the battlefield by a mile. And I don't think I've written a better unintentional segue than this before, so let's go ahead and talk demons. Enemies are broken up into classes in Doom Eternal. Ambient enemies are stationary and won't move from a fixed location during the fight. Tentacles will pop up out of the ground and take some damage from overly eager players. Buff totems are hidden in some arenas and give enemies a boost in speed and damage until found and destroyed. Turrets are introduced in the first DLC campaign, The Ancient Gods Part 1, and they just fire projectiles and can be taken out with two precision shots from the heavy rifle. Next is the fodder class. This encompasses every peon enemy you encounter, the little sh**s that aren't really a threat, but they move around a lot and make for good in-between enemies to fill the battlefield. They're also great for refilling your ammo because they're the ones that only cost one pip of gasoline to chainsaw. They're all essentially the same, but zombies will mosey around levels, mostly acting as pick-me-ups for players between big fights. I use them a lot to get challenges done. I'm sure they don't mind. <sighs> what good guys. The series' signature imps are faster than zombies, but just as easily taken out. Gargoyles are the faster and more annoying of the bunch, but they're still pretty easy to take down. And soldiers aren't quite as mobile, but they do have a more consistent rate of fire. Next are heavy demons. These are the ones that your big weapons really need to be focused on. They can take a lot of punishment and often have certain quirks that make them easier to take down. Let's start with the Arachnotron. This big spider brain isn't the most dangerous thing, but it can be if you don't take the time to destroy the turret on its head. This will take away its ability to perform most of its heavy hitting attacks and also deal a good amount of damage. The Mancubus is also in the same category, not the most intimidating but also really easy since it's such a big target. Also also, both of his arm cannons can be targeted and destroyed, again limiting his firepower. The Cyber Mancubus is a bit more serious. He can't have his cannons destroyed and his projectiles leave a toxic pool on the ground that will eat your health quickly. He does have a weakness to the blood punch, one good sock in his armor will come off with about half of his health. Doesn't mean he can't do a mean front flip though. Pinkies can also be problems if left alone. Their main method of attack is to charge straight at you. They can't really be damaged from the front, instead their tails are the only place they're vulnerable. But the game is quick to teach you that a blood punch to the face will put them down in one shot. The Carcass is an annoying little tubster. He fires extremely damaging projectiles that will take you out if you're not careful. But his worst move are these barriers he can spawn in front of the player. And they'll appear in front of you regardless of where the Carcass actually is. The Pulse Rifle can be used to overload these shield though and it'll cause a concussive blast to knock enemies back. Prowlers are similar to imps by the way they move, but you have to keep an eye on them because they can teleport behind the player and swipe them. They're probably the easiest to underestimate. Whiplash are these Medusa-like demons that are extremely tricky to land precise shots on. The way they quickly slither around has their hitbox in constant motion, making it difficult to pin them down. But explosive weapons like the rocket launcher are usually my answer to these things. Revenants will hover above the ground and fire their rockets at the player. They aren't hard to dodge, but can hit for big damage if not taken seriously. 
seriously. Both of their missile launchers can be targeted separately though, and if both of them are destroyed, they're easy pickings. The Kako Demon will fire projectiles, but they never last long for me. If you can fire a grenade from either your shotgun mod or your shoulder cannon into their mouth, they will be instantly opened up to a glory kill. Even if there are multiple Kako Demons, it makes no difference. Just aim for the mouth, even if it's closed, and then just hop from one to the other to get your free health. I thought the pain elemental would have the same easy way out the first time I encountered one, but that ended up not being the case. These beefy things can summon ambient demons called lost souls which will fly at the player and cause an explosion if not dealt with. They are way more trouble than the Cacodemon. Hell Knights are fast and physical fighters. They take a lot of pain and want to rush you down with physical attacks as quickly as possible. And their upgraded variants, Dread Knights, are even worse with energy projectiles that can be fired on top of more deadly physical attacks. Maker Drones are some of the most satisfying enemies to take down. Not because they're dangerous or have a lot of health, nah. It's pretty much the opposite. It's almost pointless to try and attack them with anything but the Heavy Rifle's Precision mod. Because when you get a head shot, they explode in a rainbow of health and ammo. And good god, when you're in the middle of an intense fight, health and ammo running low, and you see one of these things flying around making that one quick, perfect shot, it's like a shot of ecstasy, dude. It just sucks that they aren't around for more encounters in the main campaign. They're brought back for a few encounters in the DLC and they were given some good use in horde mode, but they stayed as one of my favorite enemy types. Then in the smaller category for super heavy demons, we have the Doom Hunter. This floating monstrosity of hell and tech is extremely dangerous at every range. This thing will launch seeking missiles and several other high damage moves at the player not giving them a moment to stand still. It initially has an energy shield that blocks any attack that comes its way. This shield can be taken out by the plasma rifle, but it takes so many shots to do this in my opinion. You're better off using the shotgun's auto fire mod on its sled, or even better, the mobile turret mod. Once the sled is gone, the shields drop and he's much easier to take down. Definitely an obstacle when they first appear on the battlefield, but exponentially more manageable when the shield is gone. And again, if you can take a moment to drill that sled with the mobile turret, even that phase doesn't last long. The arch vial will summon buff demons to the battlefield in not just a few the whole arena will fill with these superpowered demons. But there's a catch. The summoning takes a moment to perform, so if you can make it to him and deliver a strong attack, you can interrupt the process. But don't stick around too long unprepared because they aren't slouches on their own. Their long range attacks will put you in the dirt quickly and they will summon fire underneath you from anywhere in the arena. But I did notice that arch vials are stunned a bit longer than most other enemies. So if you utilize quick swapping, which is a mechanic that allows you to switch out weapons without having to rely on the weapon wheel, they can fall rather easily. Barons of Hell are just big boys with lots of health and heavy hitting attacks, but the Tyrant is the big bitch with some real nasty heavy hitters. And there isn't really a special way of beating them either, you just unload on them until they eventually fall. They aren't able to jump without some heavy automation though, so I found that as long as I stayed mobile, they had a hard time getting their hands on me. And then finally we have Marauders, just gonna come out and say it, Marauders can kiss my nuts. These guys have a shield, axe, and shotgun combo and are impossible to damage until waiting until they flash green and then slap them with a heavy attack like the heavy shotgun or the ballista. But their worst quirk is that their attacks operate on a proximity system. If you're too close, they'll shoot you with a shotgun. If you're too far away, they'll sling projectiles at you. They can randomly summon this panther ghost thing that's fast as shit and will stalk you anywhere you go until you take it out with something like the plasma gun. Gun, and when you're at mid-range, they'll swing the axe with that green flash, meaning the only place they need to be is mid-range. What the hell is mid-range? It's such a nothing term when you're in a 3D space. Marauders are very specific on when their proximity attacks launch, so you have to be specifically mid-range to get the only good attack to fire off. And with how much damage their attacks do on their own, staring them down and eating shotgun blasts hoping they decide to do the move you want is incredibly frustrating to deal with. When you happen to get them in the sweet spot, it's extremely easy to melt them thanks to quick swapping super shotgun and ballista shots, but trying to find that sweet spot leads to way more deaths than should be necessary. They never give them to you alongside any other super demons until post game content, so I think they at least realized how drastic different it forces you to behave. When they start feeding them to you in post-game activities, it forced me to learn how to best avoid them, clear the field of everything else, and then try to walk into their sweet spot to melt them 
down. Even still, sorry to say it, easily the worst part of the combat sandbox. There are a few extra enemy types that show up in the Ancient Gods DLC chapters, but they're all reskinned or souped up versions of other enemies that have one aspect changed to shake up the way you might play. The Screecher will scream and explode after being shot, which in turn gives any surrounding demons a massive buff to speed and damage. This makes Pinkies, which again are only vulnerable on the tail, an absolute nightmare in packs. The Stone Imp is quite obviously made to give utility to a weapon mod that hasn't gotten much love, the full lot of shotgun. The imps themselves just do this Blanca cannonball move towards you and can't be damaged by anything other than the full auto mod. It doesn't make much sense, but they aren't too hard to take out. In the same vein are cursed prowlers. If one gets a hit on you, then you'll become cursed. This just means that you won't be able to dash, and your health is constantly draining until you can hit it with a blood punch. These things are bottom of the barrel for new additions. In a similar way to the Crucible, it introduces no decisions about what actions need to be taken. It's unwise to take on any powerful demons before you can get your dash back so you have to slowly wander around the arena until you can punch this thing. And God help you if you don't have a blood punch built up already. The spirit will possess any enemy, buffing speed, damage, and most notably, health. They take a lot more punishment. And once the host has been killed, the spirit will start possessing another demon almost immediately. The only thing that can kill the spirit is the Plasma Guns Microwave mod. These are the best addition to the roster as far as I'm concerned. They feel like a proper obstacle to overcome instead of a reskin of an existing enemy designed to give attention to a neglected aspect of the arsenal. I guess technically they do that too because the microwave beam wasn't anything spectacular, but I think they add more than just that to the sandbox. Blood makers are okay, they're mostly the same as regular makers, satisfying as hell headshots and all, but now they boast more dangerous attacks and can only be head popped once they're charging up for an attack, making it a little more risky to take them out. And lastly, there's the Armored Baron. They have a full suit of armor that has to be destroyed before they can actually take damage. Plasma gun shots wear it down well enough, but much like the Doom Hunter, I don't think that's the best way to go about it. They share the Marauder's green flash mechanic, and hitting them with a precision bolt right before the big attack will destroy the armor in one shot. You'll need to act fast though because the armor will regenerate if they aren't killed quickly. The game understands how to craft interesting combat encounters with all of these pieces. Arenas in every single campaign feel very carefully built. The enemies themselves are expertly decked out and have little quirks that ask players to make thousands of decisions every time they encounter them. Power-ups are often hidden in select arenas that can do things like increase movement speed or firepower for a short time. Or maybe even give the Slayer access to instant glory kills for a bit just repeatedly ripping enemies limb from limb. I didn't mention things like power-ups in the combat analysis because I feel like these bonuses are there for the fun of it and don't really contribute to the sandbox all that much. Please don't take that as me being against their inclusion, I love the silly fun these things bring, but they don't add anything that would cause me to think critically about any situations. The only decision to make is finding the fastest route to the power-up. Horde mode has some particularly smart combinations of enemies, like asking you to kill a certain amount of one demon in a time limit, but the only two enemy types are Screechers and Hell Knights. If you attack the Screechers, they'll buff the Knights to Hell and back, and it'll take way too long to kill them. So you'll actually want to avoid killing the Screechers altogether in this small enclosed area. But that's easier said than done when you take into consideration the splash damage most weapons have. Oh, and if you don't use the BFG for an entire horde mode campaign, you're given a gigantic point bonus at the end to go towards unlockables. I don't need it. I don't need it. I definitely don't need it. Doom Guy himself has enough depth and nuance in his moveset for two characters, but the fact that they've balanced every aspect so well that it all fits so perfectly into this dance is nothing short of inspiring. I really don't know what to say at this point regarding the combat system it has created. It's genuinely one of the most robust and flawlessly executed sandboxes I've ever played with. Everything, excluding the shield mod, has a purpose and a strength. Everything is important in its own way. Every enemy is stacked like a chess piece that creates fascinating matchups in every arena they're put in. Combinations of enemies often make you use tools in ways you never have, and it's awesome to do so every time. The level design of the campaign missions is very well done too. I'm very appreciative of the hidden collectibles that are strewn all over the place. Hidden action figures, costumes, music, they're all fantastic rewards. And the ways that they're hidden is even better. And for the players that like finding collectibles and things like that, Doom Guy's ship is a perfect gallery of progress. If you all remember, when I played Devil May Cry 5, I had a habit of playing for a few hours before having to take a break from it. If you want to know what I'm talking about, feel free to check the video on the card up top, but I ultimately chalked up the problem to variety being lacking. 
Pulling off sick combos is everything I could have ever wanted and then some, but I would get burned out because the game was nothing but combat encounter after combat encounter. There's nothing wrong with this by the way, it's honestly a positive looking back that there's next to no fat in DMC5. It's all muscle, but Doom Eternal builds itself around exploration and its combat. In between ball busting arenas, you'll be exploring these locations looking for cracks in the walls or any kind of suspicious looking stuff in the environments. The dossier's map is also great at giving clues on where collectibles might be hiding. It helps give my brain a break when playing through these intense games. Because as I've explained, this shit gets very intense. And I actually did start to feel a little burnout when going through horde mode. The traversal challenges were way too small to be considered break, so it was almost nothing but back to back demon killing. Thus, I was drained after a while. They're ideal for the length that they are, but nothing I could repeatedly jump back into. I wish I had more to say on the campaign and its level design in general. It was good, hell, it was even great I'd say, but it just gets the job done. If anything, I wish there were more demanding platform challenges. The last thing I'll touch on is the battle mode. This is the multiplayer that Doom Eternal offers and it's meh. Two player controlled demons work together to kill a player controlled Doom guy. If one demon dies by the Slayer, then the other needs to stay alive long enough for their partner to respawn. Otherwise, they both get blown up and the Slayer wins. This mode only really appeals to those who, one, multiplayer is really, really your jam, or two, you've done literally everything else and just want those last few achievements battle mode is attached to. I don't mean to clown on it so hard, it isn't bad, and being able to play as some of these demons is novel. I particularly like playing as the pain elemental, but I don't think this mode has a lot of staying power. If you're inclined to ask the question which of the two modern Doom games has the better multiplayer mode, then it's obviously 2016. It felt way faster, and more true to the base game's design. Design. The Slayer, obviously, feels drastically overpowered when compared to the demons. Speed, strength, the whole shebang, the Slayer can easily dispatch both demons if they bring their A game. Meanwhile, the demons will have a really tough time pulling a win out if they're up against a seasoned Slayer. Going back for one match made me realize that 2016's multiplayer was kind of underrated and it's a legit shame we didn't get an improvement in the sequel. Battle Mode 2.0 assuredly has its fans and that's great, but to me, it's more of a blemish on an otherwise phenomenal phenomenal package. You can unlock a bunch of funny costumes for both demons and the slayer, but I don't need to come back to this mode, not when the rest of the game is so jaw-droppingly good. In the south, we have a saying, you can put butter on your boot, but that don't make it a biscuit. And what that nonsense actually means is basically you can add bells and whistles to something to turn it into something else, but it will still be the same thing underneath all that extra stuff. A good example would be Bright Memory and Bright Memory Infinite. First person shooters that had guns and melee weapons, but also had an emphasis on juggling enemies in the air with different moves. I can appreciate the attempt to make a combo heavy action game in first person, but you can't just give someone melee attacks and the same old Call of Duty controls. You have to make sure everything makes sense together. And if you don't, then you'll end up with a game that's trying to do something interesting, but just can't pull it off because of a blemish like its camera system. An action game like that requires spatial awareness to know where to place yourself and when to perform certain attacks. A first person perspective is not conducive to that goal. Doom Eternal changes everything to make sure that the camera system is never a negative. If anything, it's a positive that it's so responsive and that Doom Guy is so responsive. It works on every level. Doom Eternal as a game works on every level. No, it exceeds even the highest expectations on every level. With combat that never slows down and is always in your face, changing things up and giving players plenty of counter opportunities to turn encounters around if they have the ability to do so, players that want to be engaged will be engaged. I played on the Ultra Violence difficulty for my main campaign, Ancient Gods campaigns, and Horde Mode playthroughs, and I think that is the way Doom Eternal is supposed to be played. It never felt unfair, except maybe when they decided to pull two Marauders out, still don't like those guys. But even still, I am so ready to jump back in on the hardest difficulty to see how it stacks up. I'm sure it'll teach me things I never knew about regarding even my favorite aspects of the game, but until then, my 26 hours were very well spent. And and holy shit, this is one of the best looking games I've ever played. 2016 had a problem with its locales being pretty repetitive and stale, but Eternal knocks it out of the park with the varied locations. They're so beautiful and colorful.
colorful. I can't get enough. You've got these cities overtaken by greenery and then also overtaken by hell. You've got demonic swamps, which is so cool. And the use of ray tracing is delectable. The shotgun in particular is so reflective. I caught myself checking that thing out all the time. And how about when you shoot enemies and their flesh dynamically gets blown off? It makes using these weapons so impactful. They all feel and look so amazing thanks to these small details. And oh my god, the sound design! <laughs> Well, that was f***ing dope. It's untouchable. And the music? I revealed to you guys that I'm a metalhead when I looked at Sonic Frontier, so you can imagine my joy when this soundtrack is nothing but heavy distortion guitars, bass riffs, and bass drums. I can't get enough of this stuff, and it makes for perfect background noise amidst the demon killing. Literally nothing bad to say about how this game looks and sounds. I'm rambling at this point. Just go play Doom Eternal. Yeah, uh, I think that's going to be it for me today. Uh, I want to thank you guys for watching. Uh, I think the next time you see me, I'll be playing Final Fantasy 16 because the combat system that they've been showing off, that game looks so sick, and you know I'm going to get my hands on that thing. Uh, as for what comes after that, I really don't know. I need to play more Final Fantasy 7 because I'm having a good time playing that. Uh, there's still a VR game I want to play. Tons of other stuff. Uh, if you're new here, I thank you so, so much for watching all the way to the end, of one, end on this one because uh, it was a little bit of a beefy one, but... Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you enjoyed the combat analysis stuff, I have plenty of other videos that do similar things, like my Devil May Cry 5 video that I linked in the previous in the video. But yeah, uh, I appreciate you guys for watching, so thanks for stopping by, and have a great day.